it's Unit 9, PowerPoint slideshow, and what we're going to basically look at is some of the early discoveries about the atom. We talked about the atom a little bit in Dalton's case. Dalton had a view of an indivisible atom. In this case, we're going to move that along a little bit and start seeing what happened toward the latter part of the 1800s to help us better understand what we're looking at in terms of an atom. So before looking at this, probably you ought to read section 3.1 or so. It deals with uh, cathode ray tubes and things of that nature get an idea of what this is going to be about. And so if we take a look here, first thing we'll talk about a little bit is this idea of what we call electrolysis. Electrolysis is the ability to break things apart using electricity, taking compounds that are composed of different elements and breaking them into separate species. We're also going to look at cathode ray tubes uh, a little bit toward the latter part of the 1800s, very late 1800s. That was used to actually discover that that atoms are composed of particles. They aren't just indivisible atoms like as Dalton thought. We're going to look at the mass to charge ratio for one of the particles called an electron. Look at what the positive particles, the idea that there are positive particles inside an atom, and then we'll finally look at the finding out what the value of the electron charge is, is going to be. And so those are the topics for this section. The first battery was uh, developed by Alessandro Volta back in about 1800 or so, and he invented a cell very similar to today's batteries. And if you look at this over here in the picture, let's start with the picture over here. What you'll see is just a stack of disks in here. These are metal disks. They're alternating copper and zinc disks. And so and what happens is because of those dissimilar metals, they're actually able to generate a difference in charge, electrical charge. Inside of this cell is filled with sulfuric acid to help whatever that charge is to go back and forth between the elements. And so in this case, so I hook this thing up, put sulfuric acid in here, and use this as one electrode and this is the other electrode, this is a battery. This is generating some voltage. This is very similar. Well, you can imagine your cell phone wouldn't be as what it is today if this was a battery inside your cell phone. It'd be much different than what it looks like at this point in time. So this is an initial look at a battery. And then around this time, this again, is sort of in Dalton's era, there's a body of evidence being gathered that said, you know, matter is really composed of, of uh, things that have electrical properties to them, pluses and minuses in them as well. And so what happened is they hooked this up together. If I have this battery, it has this difference in charge, plus and minus on it. And I start exploring different compounds that I might be able to make some sense out of how things are put together from the, at the atomic level. So that's really what was useful about this battery to start with in terms of chemistry. Now, if we look at some of the experiments with electricity early on, Humphrey Davy uh, used powerful batteries. So instead of one that looks like this, it might be bigger. If you want to think of that, with more disks in that sense, and to break apart compounds and discover new elements. So what, when you think about it, back in that time period, early 1800s, we have things. We don't know what they're made out of. We want to figure out what they're made out of. One of the best ways to figure out what something's made out of is to take and actually break it into pieces. And so that's what... That's what Davy does uh, back in the early 1800s. He had a student, Faraday, Michael Faraday, who's very well known for his work in electrochemistry, uh, has some units, some numerical values named after him and all. And what he did is he recognized that the electrochemistry, uh, he dealt a lot with electrochemistry, where electrochemistry recognized that charged particles have to be present to conduct electricity. So I put some things in water and I don't get electricity conducted, apparently I'm not getting charged particles, but if I do get something conducted, I do get charged particles out of it. And so, for example, if I put sugar into water, it doesn't conduct electricity. If I put salt into water, it does conduct electricity. That's a matter of it, of the salt breaking into some sort of charged particles in the end. So let's look in the later 1800s now. We come around in 1875 or so, William Crookes developed this tube, and it's sort of an interesting looking device. I'm, uh, glass tube along here, and this glass tube is mostly evacuated. It has very little of anything in it, very little air or anything we draw, try to draw a vacuum on it. And it's hard to see in this picture I've got of it, but up here is, along here, there's a screen back along here, a coated screen. That coated screen, uh, if you looked at it from the top, it kind of curves a little bit. It doesn't go straight down the middle line of this tube. It actually curves a little bit. <coughs> and on each end of the tube, then, we've got what's called an electrode. There's an electrode out here. On this end, and there's an electrode over on this end as well. Okay, so the idea in this tube uh, goes something like this: is if I take it, I put a high voltage over here. So if I take it, I have this metal disc on this end. If I take it and put a high voltage across from here to this point, what will happen is, well, first you don't know what will happen. What you find happening is over on the right-hand side. On the right-hand side, what happens is I apply the voltage over here. What I'll see on that screen in the back. That screen in the back along here, what I'll see happening 
is I'll see a colored line form. The color of the line doesn't tell me anything about the particles. It could depend on what I've coated the screen with. In this particular case, I've I've lied to you. I've painted, I've drawn that yellow line in myself. But normally it'll be like blue or green or purple. It just depends what the coating is on that screen in the back. So as something comes from here and hits that screen, it lights it up, and it can tell you have a stream of something coming from one side to the other when you do that. And so when you look at the uh, at this, this is a cathode here. This is a negatively charged here. What this says is that when I have things, particles coming across here like this, that means that I have probably negative particles coming across because they're coming out of that negative side. And it turns out it doesn't matter what metal I make this electrode out of here. It doesn't matter what the metal is. I get the same behavior of these particles as they come across. Stream of particles. We'll look a little bit at the next page about bending it and that sort of thing and see what happens there. So when we start looking at those cathode ray tubes, and by the way, if you've heard of cathode ray tubes, that may be because you're old, <clears throat> but back in the old days when TVs first came out, and actually you still see computer monitors around, some like this, they have the big, big tube thing, like a big box in the back of the monitor. Those are cathode ray tubes. Those are huge tubes. Basically, it's made out of millions of these cathode rays, if you want to think of it like that, where each little stream of beams, stream of particles, hits your screen and lights up a pixel on your screen to give you your color. Those are CRTs, cathode ray tubes. This would be a really bad TV set. It only has one pixel in it. So Thompson comes along in 1897, starts looking at Crookes tubes, about 20 years after Crookes tube came out. And what he found out was that if he takes a magnet like this up in here, it holds that magnet up against this cathode ray tube. Now notice that normally these particles would be traveling straight along here, coming right across like that. But when you hold the magnet up, that particle actually bends. And if I hold the magnet the other way, I can get the particle to bend up. So I have one pole will bend it down, one pole will bend it up. And furthermore, depending on the strength of the magnetic field I have, the strength of the magnet I've got, I can get it to bend different amounts. Well, for physics folks, this is an important thing because they understood at that point already the relationship between the strength of a magnetic field and the, the fact that it can curve charged particles and what the relationship is between the strength of the field and the charge in the particles. So what, what Thompson was able to do was by studying this, looking at different magnetic strengths, uh, different uh, magnetic strengths, different different elements coming out of here, made a couple clearing observations. One of those observations is it didn't matter what metal I had over here as my electrode, the particles that came out behaved the same. They bent the same in the same magnetic field. That was important. Uh, the other thing is that because he had a relationship between the magnetic field and the curvature he got, he could figure out what the charge to mass ratio was in these particles. How many coulombs? Coulombs is a unit of charge we use. How many coulombs are per kilogram of particles that I've got? And so what he found out was it didn't matter what the metal is here, which means that these particles are common to all these different elements, copper, zinc, silver, whatever I put in there, I get the same behavior of these particles. That particle is common to all the elements. This is contrary to what Dalton said 100 years before that when he said those are indivisible atoms. It turns out they have some structure and they have some common, uh, common particles across, across the different elements. And then in about 1886 or so, uh, Eugene Goldstein, this is actually before, uh, before Thompson, but it's important because what he did is recognize that in the cathode ray tube, which had been known for about 10 years by then, that, okay, we have these guys, we have this idea that we have these negative particles coming through here when we have this solid disk as an electrode. What happens if I cut holes in here? What if I cut holes in here and here and here? And let's see if there's any particles coming back the other way. And sure enough, it turned out that when he measured that, these part of positive particles are coming back this way. And so now all of a sudden we find out that, that atoms have both positively and negatively charged particles. And the negative particles are the same no matter what the atom is. It turns out in this case that if I have different different element down here, if I have uh, copper, if I have silver, if I have whatever I have down here, that when the positive particle comes through here, they'll have different masses depending on what element they are. Okay, but we have the idea now we've got both positive and negative particles in here. The positive particles varied in mass, but the, elect the negative particles, the electrons, are the same in each case. And then Millikan comes along with what's called an oil drop experiment. And the oil drop experiment does this. Back from Thompson, <coughs> sorry, back from Thompson's day, we knew that, that there was a 
charge to mass ratio for these electrons, he called them, these negative particles, as he called them. And so the question now is, well, if I have a charge to mass ratio, then if I know what the charge is or I know what the mass ratio is, I know what the other one is. If something has a 2 to 1 ratio and one of the things that is 5, then the other one's 10. We kind of know that. And so Millikan developed an experiment that looks something like this, and I couldn't really find a good simulation to do. I was going to show you that, but they all were kind of, kind of sporadic. But what we look at in Millikan's oil drop experiment is down here in this corner right here. Okay, what we've got is he's got a microscope so he can see what goes on inside of this chamber. We have a plate up here that's positively charged. We have a plate down here that's negatively charged. And in here we have an x-ray source coming in. So we're going to take and beat up these particles when they fall through. And you'll take and have, spray a little oil on it using this atomizer up here. It just draws in these different particles. These could be oil droplets, whatever. That's where the oil drop name comes from. So you sprinkle these things up into here. And what will happen, if everything's turned off, what's going to happen? Well, if I sprinkle something up in here, gravity will take over and it'll start falling down here. Okay, now he cut a small hole in the middle here so he could get a small sample to look at, kind of narrow what it is he's going to see. And what he's done now is set it up so when this particle falls through here, comes down along here, that the x-ray is going to ionize, we call it ionize, it's going to strip it and make a charge on that particle. Okay, he's going to take and basically he's going to strip off electrons, what he's going to do. And what happens now is this particle has a charge to it. Okay, he's going to have some sort of a... a, a uh, a negative charge to him at that point. And so what will happen here is that as this particle is falling through here, okay, if I didn't turn on my plus and minus, turn into my voltage at all, that particle will still just fall through due to gravity. But now if I turn on this bottom plate and make it negative, and on the top plate's positive, I take and I start increasing the negative charge on this plate down here, keep in mind that opposite charges repel each other. So if this guy has got a negative charge on him, and he's got a negative charge in his plate, then he's going to be repelled from the plate on the bottom. So gravity is making him come down like this. The negative charge is making him go up like this. If I change the voltage on this plate just right, I can get that particle just hang in space. I can balance it out. And so that tells me something about the actual charge that I have in that particle. Based on my voltage, based on gravity, based on all these things, I can figure out something about the actual charge I have in that particle. And so what Milliken did is he did this experiment, and he found out there were multiples of a charge. He had all sorts of, some of these things might pick up a negative charge, might have a positive charge, might have, I'm sorry, might have a negative charge, two negative charges, three negative charges. There are multiples of that, but he found what that smallest number was, that smallest common um, uh, charge was going to be, and it turned out to be something like 1.6 times 10 minus 19th coulombs. I don't care about that number so much. But once he knew that charge, then because Thompson had a mass to charge ratio from before, we can figure out the mass of the electron, and it turns out to not be very much. 9.1 times 10 minus 31 kilograms. Remember, if you want to put that in normal notation, there's your decimal point. You move it 31 places back to the left, so that's pretty small. So what we've got now is common particles, subatomic particles, the electron. We have a hunch there are some positive particles. They vary in mass. And we have an idea of what the mass and charge of the electron is out of these experiments.